We have a problem with the way that we produce food. And it's a big one. It's very complex. It involves the whole world. And just like any complex issue, we're going to need a variety of solutions in order to fix it. And I'm here today because I'm part of a small group of people around the world who think that insects can be part of that solution. We research and develop insects as an alternative to traditional feed ingredients that are harmful to our planet. And it's a new industry, so 101 style, I want to ask you a question. What do you eat? You're thinking meat, or seafood, or vegetables, or some combination of those, but who here thought soy? Every one of you in this hangar eats a lot of soy. And it's in the processed foods that you snack on. It's in the meat that you eat. So how much meat have you eaten today or this week? In a year, everyone in this hangar has eaten roughly 270 pounds of meat. And so has everyone else in North America. So all of that meat that we eat has to eat too. What do we feed it? We feed it corn and soy and wheat and fish meal. Mainly though, they eat a lot of grains and we grow all those grains. We grow them in Brazil and Canada and Argentina and the US and China. We grow grains intended for feed on 40% of the land surface. 40% of the land surface is used to feed the animals that we eat. And when we need more, we don't look around for alternatives. We clear more. So just keep that number in mind, 40% of land and when we need more, we clear more. We're all very concerned about the forest that we're, going, that we're clearing to produce this feed. And we're particularly concerned for the forests in Brazil because those forests account for 20% of our world's oxygen. So when we're no longer in a position to clear more land, breathability-wise or other, what do we do? Do we plan to clear it all? Do we have a plan? And despite what clearing that forest would do to us environmentally, what do we plan to feed the animals that we eat? There are actually a lot of really cool options out there. Petri dish meat, for example, meat grown from stem cells, that would require no crops. And genetically modified organisms will continue to contribute to crop production in incredible ways. Not just think making plants hardier, faster growing, but maybe without as much water or soil. And this kind of stuff, it scares people, GMOs and stem cell meat, but we have to accept that our planet is changing dramatically and we're growing beyond the safe operating limits of this planet. I think that we'll react to this kind of problem in a variety of solution and actions. I think that we'll incorporate things right into our diet that we've never even considered before, like insects. And maybe we won't be eating them in their whole form, but as an additive to be put into breads or pastas or as an imitation of meat, I think this kind of thing is inevitable because when you learn about how nutritious insects can be, suddenly farming solutions are all around you. And insects work so well because of their nutritional similarity to soy. And I pick on soy for that reason, but for a few other reasons too. See. Soy is 80% grown for feed, and 70% of our accessible fresh water goes to feed. So that's a big chunk. Soy is also a big contributor to land degradation because we grow it as a monoculture. That means that we plant the same crop over and over. We leach the soil of its nutrients until it has none. So we have to apply lots of fertilizers in order to feed the soil so we can grow the soy. And we add so many fertilizers to these crops that we've doubled the amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen in our atmosphere. And we've added so much fertilizers to these crops that we've just disrupted the natural nitrogen cycle of our planet. The total impact that this has on our planet cannot be overstated. So what could we do to alleviate some of the pressure on crops? Simply, we could stop eating meat, but I don't see that happening. We could also introduce things into our diet like insects of different proteins, but that's a change and changing habits is really hard for people. A change paired with a general revulsion to the idea, it's a tough sell. So you know who loves eating insects? Cows, chickens, 
and hogs. It's interesting because soy can't just be replaced by anything. It's actually a really cool plant in that it's high in protein, and that's one of the reasons farmers love it. They also love it because it's heavily subsidized in the U.S., so it's cheap. But they also love it because it's better digested than other grains. But insects are better digested than soy, and insects have comparable protein content, if not higher, and insects have higher calcium and iron levels and nutrients that are completely absent in soy altogether. My favorite thing about insects, so cool, is that we can actually change their nutritional content. We can change it depending on how we raise them. We can tailor make an insect diet to meet different requirements for different animals or for different uses entirely. And insects are not just more environmentally friendly than grains, they can be environmentally beneficial because we raise them on waste streams. We divert things like beer grain and vegetable pulp headed to the landfill back into the food system. We close that loop. That relieves pressure not only on landfills, but on crops. And so we're dealing with really big numbers here. 40% of land and 70% of water and whatever percent of landfills. This is really where we can make a big change starting literally from the ground up. And we don't have to rely on psychological barriers or consumer behavior. So the insects, they turn that low-grade waste into high-quality protein. They mate like crazy. And they do produce waste on their own, yes, but their waste is nutrient-dense, and that can be sold, too, to farmers and gardeners. Our only problem is that we can't make enough of it. We can't meet the demand. And that sounds like a really good thing, but it's actually a really big problem. And this is where we have an opportunity for innovation. And I'm talking Elon Musk-style innovation, because if we have to produce at the scale of corn or wheat or soy meal, that's how we have to think. Big. We need to think agricultural food production revolution kind of big. And it's really fun to do when you're dealing with this, something like an insect. To think of them as important or life-saving, because when you're a kid, you think bugs are pests. They're gross. They can hurt you. You never think that they're nutritious, they're abundant, and they can be sold as food. I'm not an entomologist, I am not a food scientist, and I don't have an MBA. I am an entrepreneur, a measly founder of this company, Ovbug. And 40 years from now, I'm going to be in my 60s, as will many of you in this hangar. And 40 years from now, there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet. So I'm not saying that we need to stop crop production. I don't think that's possible. Our demands on agriculture will not go away. They'll increase. They'll increase because our growth is unfathomable compared to any other time and compared to any other species in the history of the world. And I get it. That's really hard to wrap your head around something like that. It's harder still to think seriously then about how we're going to cope with that. But the UNFAO held a conference three years ago addressing the human population and addressing how we're going to keep all these people fed and well. And then one year ago, they released a journal on insects and how insects can be used for feed and for food. It's one solution. And we've come a long way to see insects in this light. I would argue that we've come full circle because in the beginning, we ate insects. They were abundant and nutritious. Why not? Um, then we began farming. We planted crops, and we raised animals in one spot, and we didn't need to forage for insects so much. And as we relied more and more on the crops for food, the insects became more of a nuisance because they liked our crops too, and maybe they annihilated them, and maybe this kind of thing happened two years in a row, and that would be frustrating, and you can imagine how angry we would get with insects. And through those kinds of battles, a competition was born a competition for resources. And insects became the enemy. They became something to fight off and repel, and we devised ways to pollute and prevent them to death, and we did a really good job of it, because now we have genetic variations in plants that repel insects and withstand frost, and we have chemicals that we can put onto our crops 
that saved them from nicks and bites and plagues and even time. And now we rely on these methods to grow our crops the way we like. But these kinds of methods can't save us from all crop battles and eventually insects become immune and we'll have to go back to the drawing table or we'll have to make stronger chemicals and that kind of mentality has never sat well with me because it doesn't work. This controlling nature mentality. And that's why I like insects in feed because it's a part of a natural diet for the animal. It's healthier for the animal, for the consumer, and, where is it, for the planet. So I want to invite insects back into our lives and onto our farms. Because if we can do that, then I can see a world where we've reduced industrial crop production to the point where we have salvaged some forests. If not for us or our kids or theirs, then for the ecosystems that thrive there that make the quality of life that we have today possible. And I can imagine farmers in Brazil growing a variety of vegetables and other food for themselves and growing their own economies, and strengthening their own land, instead of feeling incentivized to export soy. And I can see people like me and you eating meat that was humanely raised on a diet that it was designed to digest, where it didn't have digestive problems to the point where the farmer is required to medicate the whole lot from the get-go. Putting insects into agriculture is not the answer to any food crisis. It is one solution, one very simple, very logical solution, and what more can you want from a solution? So, as we approach this very urgent and complex time in human Earth's history, I have hope. Because through ecological solutions like this one, we can enter a phase of recovery. And perhaps just through the way we live, we can sustain life. Thank you.